Okay, <clears throat> good evening, everyone. We'll uh, say the prayer and then uh, we'll continue. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, both now and into the ages of ages. Amen. Glory to thee, O God. Glory to thee, O heavenly King. Comfort the Spirit of truth, who are everywhere, present and filled with soul things. Treasure of blisses and giver of life. Come and abide in us, and cleanse us from every impurity, and save our souls, a good one. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and into the ages of ages. Amen. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, the mercy in us and save us. Okay, uh, once again, good evening to everyone. Uh, I hope you were able to get some rest during the Christmas break. We took a break for a couple of weeks from, from the Bible studies. We continue today with the um, um, with, uh, already announced uh, talk about the Protestantism, the Reformation, and the fall of the, the Christianity in the West. Uh, I'll share my screen with you so we can uh, we can see what we're going to talk about and uh, get to know better this subject. Uh, we will um, have a little bit of uh, let's say a superficial uh, introduction into the into this topic because we cannot of course cover in depth everything, but we will try to focus on the most important points of this subject. And God willing, when we have time, we'll continue with other similar subjects so we can uh, know uh, a little bit more about uh, this uh, issue or this problematic. So uh, let's uh, let's start. Let me see. I'll just share the screen. Screen. Okay. That's it. Share. Um, and I will. Um, I hope we can all see it. Uh, let me see. Just. Okay, I hope you can all see uh, the, the, the screen in front of you. So the reason I wanted to talk about this is because of course we are surrounded with a lot of people, our brothers and sisters who belong to different types of uh, Christian denomination, mainly Protestant uh, in, in origin. So uh, it's good to know what is the orthodox perspective uh, uh, in this whole thing. I used uh, as a motivation for this lecture, uh, a speech or a lecture by a priest, Father Goran from uh, Netherlands, uh, from the Serbian Orthodox Church, who speaking to his parishioners, he was, uh, because he lives in a, in a country where in a way Protestantism originated from Germany and Switzerland and so on and in that part of uh, Europe. Uh, to go deeper into into this subject, so we can I can share it with you, and we can all get to know uh, what, what is going on. So we all know that uh, in the 16th century, specifically uh, in the in the year 1517, we have uh, the Protestantism emerging, the Reformation, and the fall of the Christianity. So in Wittenberg, uh, so we are talking about. 1500 years after the Pentecost uh, in Jerusalem, Luther uh, puts a paper on the door of the Roman Catholic Church as opposed to how many compromises have they made and it culminated with the abuse of the indulgences. So we are talking about a period of time where unfortunately the Roman Catholic Church, because it was in this uh, process of building new churches, the Sistine Chapel and, and other uh, churches that even today, when you go and visit those monumental um, uh, parts of art, you'll see that it required a lot of resources, manpower, and above all money, finance to build them. So one of the ways, maybe the main way how they sponsored uh, the building of those, uh, uh, all of those buildings was by taking money from the people, promising them that they will forgive their sins. And these are the famous indulgences, which is uh, just a, a very visible manifestation of the deep, deep corruption that existed in that time in the Western church, especially in the Roman Catholic church. So it starts as a consequence of the following display of events, uh, that there is a church, a temple uh, being built in Rome, and other places in the uh, uh, former Roman empire. So we go to the people and we ask for their contributions. And these contributions were very speculative, very, um, uh, very suspicious in their, let's say, uh, just see here. Uh, yeah, very suspicious because they uh, are going with, uh, with something that, uh, of course, 
we cannot forget that people at the time were very poor. You imagine Europe at the, in the 16th century, the so-called famous cities were the po most uh, populated cities were not more than 10 to 15,000 people. What we have uh, now, million uh, in numbers uh, of people, inhabitants, like uh, cities like Paris, Rome, and others were, are coming later with the development of the industrialization and Renaissance, and of course, later the, the, the age of enlightenment and so forth. So at the time, it was, of course, a huge burden on the people, and these indulgences were uh, obvious corruption. People were uneducated, uh, and Martin Luther, who was a monk himself, uh, and an educated uh, person, uh, was rightfully so uh, going against his indulgences. So uh, if you need forgiveness of sins, the church would say, well, you can pay now and we'll forgive you your sins and the sins of your parents and grandparents for generations and so on. This is also something that uh, is a theology of that was strange to the to the church. It never existed before. Uh, also, we'll talk about purgatory, but more in depth, we'll talk about when uh, we're going to talk about the relationship or the differences in the theology between the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic uh, Church. So, the outrage of Martin Luther and many others at the time, it's not something him, uh, was obvious. He was an Augustinian monk, Roman Catholic monk at the time, who lived in celibacy. And uh, we have to understand that in Roman Catholic Church, we had a lot of uh, different orders, even today. So, he belonged to this order and uh, like many others, uh, was publicly speaking against the abuse the Roman Catholic Churches was doing against uh, against its own people. So, who are the most famous uh, uh, reformists who determined the future of the Christianity in the West? We talk about Luther, who was a German, Heidrich Zwingli, or Ehrlich Zwingli, a German, who was born on January the first, 1484, and died in 1531, October. Calvin from Switzerland, John Wycliffe from England, Haas also spelled Haas, who was born in 1370 uh, in Bohemia in what is now the Czech Republic, died in July 6, 1450. So we have this uh, movement of, of thought, uh, of Protestant thought, even before the, the 16th century, at the end of the 15th century. But we take this as the, uh, as the year of when uh, Martin Luther uh, pinned that, that uh, Protestant uh, uh, on, the, on the doors uh, of the temple in Germany. So there were others uh, as well uh, who were leading the protests, pr protests, but they were the leading people of the protests against Roman Catholics at the time. So uh, these are the ones, most influential ones that you know, the most prominent ones. Of course, it happened that the Roman Catholic Curia uh, persecuted them and take them to courts. Uh, they, the Roman Catholic Church, of course, was not happy with uh, this rebellion that was happening. So, for example, we have a form of martyrdom for people like Huss, uh, who was burned at the stake. They persecuted Luther, but they couldn't do anything to him because uh, the people loved him. And why? Because, of course, he was justly protesting for a lot of wrongdoings by the Roman Catholics. There are completely non-Christian teachings to the, uh, to the church uh, and practices. So, also, he starts to translate the Holy Bible on a more national people's language. This was the first German who takes the Bible and all the services, which, which were at the time all in Latin. And most of the people couldn't understand uh, the meaning or what they were hearing. So he starts to translate it all uh, for them in German, a common language that everyone can understand and follow. Um, this is something that uh, we have to understand that when the initial uh, thing that Luther does, which is to, uh, to translate the Bible, was a practice started uh, by the church earlier. We know that, for example, I'll, I'll speak for the uh, Slavic nations. Uh, we have movement in the ninth century where Byzantine missionaries, uh, Cyrilus and Methodius, were sent to the northern parts of Byzantine Empire, which was mainly populated by the Slavic tribes who were pagans, to translate the Bible from Greek into Slavonic languages. And this is how we have the first creation of the Slavonic alphabet, which was called Glagolica. And then uh, St. Clement and now, the disciple of St. Cyrilus and Methodius, are continuing their work. Uh, and uh, they're creating even a university in Ohrid, which is on the lake of Ohrid in today's northern Macedonia, where they uh, 
create the first university, if you will, with more than 3,000 uh, students. And Clement dies in 1916, which is in the beginning of the 10th century. But they create the Cyrillic language, that the one that we still use today in our church. So, for example, our church, uh, the, the Slavonic churches, we use the Church Slavonic language. The Greek use the Greek uh, uh, church language as a liturgical language. This is not a language that we can speak and use in our everyday use. It's only used for liturgical purposes. So, for example, a priest from the Serbian Orthodox Church, if he travels to Moscow, Bulgaria, or any Slavonic or Slavic country, uh, it will be very natural to use the Church Slavonic language. The Church Slavonic language, I myself have studied for a long period of time, you will see that was created and designed in such a way to be a, a, a very almost perfect mimic of the Greek language. Even the syntax, even doesn't fit in the Slavonic syntaxes or uh, the order of the, the words in the sentence, will still follow the original syntax as it is written in the old Greek because it comes from the Bible direct. That's how the, the Holy Fathers who were creating this uh, alphabet were very, very careful not to change the, uh, not to change the, the meaning of the, of the words of the Bible and to translate them in an accurate translation. Even the very alphabet is very similar to the Greek alphabet, even though it has more characters than, than the Greek alphabet. But this is a just small digression to just to emphasize the fact that uh, Martin Luther was not the only one. As a matter of fact, when Silas and Methodius tried to do this, to translate the Bible in Slavonic, uh, in, at a time language that they designed, they were persecuted for that. And uh, the reason why they were persecuted, because there was this idea, or we can even call it a heresy of the three languages, that you are not allowed to preach, serve, or use any other language when it comes to the gospel in the churches, but rather Latin. Uh, Hebrew and Old Greek. Uh, of course, this was debunked because uh, many Slavic churches became uh, Christian because of the translation. So similar thing is done by Martin Luther, which is a very noble thing to do. But, and this is a big but, uh, we, we're now moving to the, to the section where we um, what like to explain, which is the changing of the words of the Holy Scripture. Martin Luther starts something that uh, is very dangerous because, and this is not something that uh, just I'm saying, but uh, if you look at the history, even if you talk to the Protestant scholars, they also are very familiar with this. He changes the meaning of the original words of the Holy Scriptures. At the very beginning of the Reformation, the principal Bible available was the Latin Vulgata, uh, that uh, the, Bible, the Bible Jerome had originally produced in the Latin in the 380 after Christ. Uh, though by the time of the Reformation, it has undergone significant textual corruptions. It included both a translation of the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament, plus Tobit, Judith, Wisdom of Solomon, Sirach, Baruch, some addition to the book of Daniel, and the first and the second book of uh, uh, Maccabees. So uh, when we, uh, to give you the, the example of the uh, about why, why this happened and how, how dangerous this was is uh, again from this priest from, uh, from Poland, from, from Netherlands, who belongs to the Serbian and the church. He says that one day while he was uh, reading the gospel uh, where Christ says, this generation is cleansed only with fasting and prayer. Uh, when he was reading in Serbian, he would read this part and then he opened the, 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 the Dutch version to read it in, in the native language over there. When he started reading, this generation is cleansed only by prayer. And the word fasting was removed. There was no word fasting within the sentence. It was very strange to him. So, so uh, however, this, uh, this was very, very hard to, to, for him to do. And he noticed that the, this was not uh, normal. So what happened to the word fasting? Uh, so someone, of course, took it off. Uh, and it, you can imagine the arrogance to erase the words from the Holy Scriptures. Uh, so Luther erases words he doesn't like. Uh, one well-known uh, linguist, Dr. Ling, from that time asks the question, who dares to change or erase the words from the Bible? Uh, on which authority can someone does this? You know that the answer that he got was because Darthin, Dr. Martin Luther said so. So we are... Uh, 
we, we have to understand something that when I want to make the comparison, for example, how the Holy Fathers have translated the, the Slavic Bible from, from the Greek original, they were so careful, careful and meticulous in, in changing, the, not changing, not even the syntax of the, of, the, of the text of the Bible that sometimes it's even hard to understand in Thessalonians because you have to know a little bit of Greek to understand the meaning why the words are being done in that. The reason why they did this was because they wanted, didn't want it to change nothing that was um, uh, identical to the original. So uh, the logical consequences of it is that if Luther can, Luther can do this to reform the Bible itself, then we can correct uh, and reform Luther if we disagree with it. Then Ulrich Zwingli, who is also authority in the Reformation, says to Luther, you're insisting on having the Holy Eucharist is stupid. Now the Eucharist is only a symbolism. And they started to, to change the complete meaning of the Bible. And if, if, you, can, if you can dare to change the, the Bible, then uh, a lot of different uh, theologies, of course, in, saying in quotes, can come out of it. So for it's important to note, to, to, uh, to mention that uh, the, that uh, in 1500 years, so we're talking about the period of since the Pentecost in Jerusalem, no one has ever questioned the importance and the necessity of the Holy Eucharist, for example, because uh, that's something that will come out uh, uh, as an issue within the Protestantism. Maybe there were some small arguments regarding the theology and the practice of the Eucharist, but we all knew that it is the essential mystery of sacrament of the Church of Christ is the real body and blood of Christ. Well, Zwingli says that it is only symbolism and starts an argument with Luther. And as we are all witnessing today in the 21st century, maybe for the half of the Protestants in the whole world, if not more than that, the Holy Eucharist is not real, but only a symbolism of a sort. It's only an uh, anamnesis in Greek, which means just a remembrance of the mystical supper, meaning a commemoration of a sort. Uh, so, we can see how far has gone. When Zwingli died, Luther says to some of his friends, for example, this is a victory of ours, Zwingli is gone. And we can see that kind of um, even uh, antagonism that existed between them at the time. We'll, we'll go into this deeper to understand the whole uh, uh, thing because not just the Eucharist, then we have as, as a consequences of that, we also have some other things like the revival, resurrection of the uh, iconoclasm. But before I continue, I would like to just emphasize um, something uh, very important. Luther, when he starts to do this, even though in, initially the, the, the translating the Bible in German was a noble idea, and, and of course uh, we agree with that, even though we accept and we can understand the fact that he was against the corruption in the Roman Catholic Church, who was literally stealing money from the people in order to fulfill their own projects in Rome or whatever. The problem with Luther is that, I don't know if you know this, probably you know that, you know that he was a, a priest, a monk, who, um, first of all, that I myself find as a, and, and my, a lot of the church fathers, a lot of the Orthodox Christians find this is a great sin, that he abandoned his monastic oath. He took away his cassock. He became a layman because of that, and he married a nun. And a, a little subtlety on this, he even consumed the marriage with this nun before they got officially married in the church. So for, for spiritual people, this is the beginning of the fall of, of Luther, and everything else that happens is just the consequences of his actions later. And the arrogance to later go and change the words of the Bible, as we can see, he not just that he that he removed certain uh, books of the Bible, but he also wanted to remove the the, the letter of Saint James, the Patriarch of Jerusalem, the, uh, the first the Bishop of Jerusalem, because he didn't agree with the sola fide and the sola scriptura uh, uh, writings inside of it, and there are many other. Uh, of course, aspects that are very suspicious, and and we need to, uh, you know, pay attention to them. But as as we mentioned, that there was a dispute about uh, some of the Protestants believing that uh, the Eucharist, for example, was a real body and blood. Some of them know it's just a symbol. Let me explain something. Uh, that the word symbolos in 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 Greek has a different meaning what it means today when we say the word symbol which is just something that we call symbolic, a representation of something. In the, in the Eastern languages, in, in Greek, symbolo means something that is 
a participation in something, that it reminds us of the archetype. So even if you hear the word symbols, it doesn't refer that it's just a symbol, it's a, like an idea or a metaphor, but it's a, the real thing. It's the archetype of the body and blood of Christ. It's the real body and blood of Christ, not just uh, an idea or metaphor or some sort of a uh, symbolical representation. And you will, we will see now uh, that the Protestantism, when we go deeper and in, understand the differences within the uh, within the uh, Protestant denominations that now just in the United States, we have more than 40,000 of them. You will see that they are, uh, have resurrected the so-called iconoclasism, something that the church fought as a heresy in the eighth and the ninth century. And you know, in the last ecumenical council, the seventh ecumenical council in the year 780, um, 787, we have this situation where uh, the fathers of the church triumphantly uh, forbade the, uh, the, the heresy which taught that the icons are idols and they should not have any kind of purpose or um, role into the, into the church. Uh, why is this? Because you will see that in the Protestantism, not even probably aware of that, uh, it's uh, filled with many, uh, many hazen or dualism, which, from which originates the iconoclast. So all over the Western world, all that is icon, picture, statue, vestments, incense, all that relates to our five senses, as we say when we go to church, is being thrown away and removed. All of that was destroyed and burned in their anger following uh, Luther and the Formans, all of the Protestants. And that's what their name is showing. They're actually getting seduced by an ancient heresy called Manichism, a dualistic religious system with Christian, Gnostic, and pagan elements founded in Persia in the third century by Manis, uh, we, you're talking about the year 216 and 276 before Christ. And uh, the system was based on a supposed uh, primeval conflict between light and darkness. It spread widely in the Roman Empire and in Asia. Manus thought that the body, the material world, uh, and all of the nature with that, is from the devil and that the soul, the spiritual world, is from God and that is in a constant battle with the body. Probably even in the Eastern religions, you would remember the, the words yin-yang. We had a similar heresy in the Byzantine Empire in the face of the what we call the Bogomils. Uh, it was basically a heresy that was condemned by the church long time ago. So the Protestants basically accepted the heresy of Manichaeism as part of their doctrine. The soul is from God and the body is not important. The body is unclean, ugly, decays, and so on, which is contrary to what the church is saying. Then uh, why did the Lord uh, came incarnated in a body becoming a God-man, which is the logical conclusion. Well, uh, just to explain about the Bogomils, in the Byzantine Empire, uh, we're talking about somewhere between the period of, of uh, the 8th to, to the 11th century. Those were the people who basically believed that everything that has to do with the material world, uh, everything that exists, including our bodies, is defiled, sinful. And for that reason, we need to break free from that. Similar to this, we have some uh, Hellenistic uh, philosophers who would thought that the body is the prison of the soul and when we die we should break free from this realm of the material existence into the ethereal or the spiritual existence where we break free and unite ourselves with the gods or god and the deities and so forth why is this heresy is because the dualism exists in in monism in manism and even before that in in different so here on the right corner you have the, the map of progression westwards of the dualist sect. So we have uh, Publicins, we have Manichism, we have Bogomils, we have Cotters, and many others. But all of these are, uh, uh, are were, for example, the Bogomils, they spread from the Byzantine Emperor all the way to, the, to, to Spain. And uh, they were, of course, condemned in many local and regional uh, uh, councils by the church. Uh, because the main fact why we, we resist, why we cannot accept this false teaching is because Christ himself became 100% human. So to many of you who are, uh, who are listening uh, many times when we talk about the ecumenical council, especially during our catechism classes, the reason why the fathers defended the fact that Christ is 100% human and 100% God is because of the propagation of this heresy who are trying to teach this dualism that has very, very had a very, very powerful impact on people. 
And you will see that in many Protestant denominations, they still uh, acknowledge this dualism as something, uh, uh, something real. For example, uh, someone recently asked me, I think it was Jennifer, she said, uh, well, the words, what does the words mean in the 50th Psalm when King David says about that, uh, you have known me from my mother's womb, uh, that my nature, I'm just paraphrasing now because I don't know that by heart the whole Psalm in English, uh, that uh, our nature is sinful. It is not sinful. Our nature is not sinful. Our nature is fallen. And there is a difference in that because if we agree with the fact that this whole world is sinful or fallen or or that it's not good that it's decaying that it's um, um, um that, that it's opposite to what god is and what the spiritual world is then we are creating a new god who is an opposite god of the god who is good but we know from the very beginning of the bible moses tells us that god when he creates the world in the book of genesis he says he said and it be and he saw a god saw that it was good and that everything that God creates is good. What happens, why it changes and why it becomes evil is because of the perversion or the distortion of our free will. As we have said many times, there is no such thing as ontological evil. The evil itself does not exist on ontological level, doesn't have its own essence. The essence that we give to the evil is every time when we pervert our free will and out of that, the outcome is evil. And uh, basically, all of the dualistic uh, uh, religions, they have uh, that kind of approach. And iconoclasm is basically very closely connected to dualistic uh, sects or to du dualistic um, teachings. So, you know, um, we, 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 can, we can talk about uh, many, many, uh, uh, many, many aspects of it, but the church teaches that the body is not evil, that even the body needs to be transfigured as it is given by God. So that's why we enter the Orthodox Church and our whole being is immersed into the church, into the mystical presence of God. So we remember when we said many times that when we get into the church, the church invites us, invites all of our five senses to be fully immersed into the mystical uh, language of the church or to the, to the celebration of God. With our nose, we smell the incense. With our ears, we hear or listen to the chant. With our eyes, we see the icons. We see our brothers and sisters present in the divine liturgy. With our lips, we kiss and we touch, uh, uh, kiss the icons where we eat and drink uh, the body, body and blood of Christ. So basically, there is no part of our sensual creation of our material body that is not participating. As another example, we have many, many relics of saints uh, who uh, did not sanctify only their souls in their holiness of their life, but the Holy Spirit sanctified their bodies and they're still incorruptible to this day. One example that we have in America is St. John of Shanghai and San Francisco. In Serbia, we have St. Basil of Ostrich. In, in Greece, we have St. Spiridon and, and many, many um, uh, saints in the Orthodox Church, which is a literal confirmation of the words of the Psalms, where it says, the bones, the, uh, the bones of your holy ones shall not see corruption. And even Christ himself, if he wanted to just create and save our souls, he would have never had the need to become a man. But God becomes, Christ becomes full man and remaining a full God. He becomes a theanthropos, bogo cholek, or God man in order to sanctify not just the soul, but also the body. This is a very fundamental truth in the Orthodox Church, and that's why uh, the Church has always defended the, the fact that Christ is 100% God, 100% human, uh, un, uh, unified in one hypostasis, in one person of the Jesus uh, Christ. So we are all immersed into the mystery of salvation into the body of Christ, which is the Church. So for comparison in the Protestant temple, you can see only the priest and the people standing at the wide empty walls of the church building and listen to the hymns and the pastor's holy. So at the time, and even today, the Protestantism was against anything that can be sensible. That's why we're making this comparison with the uh, monism and iconoclasts, iconoclasts at the time. So um, today, for example, an average Protestant may knows the Bible, and we'll explain about that, why, why they know the Bible. We're going to talk about the Sola Scriptura and Sola Fide. But they have no knowledge of the history of the church and its uh, holy tradition. That's why they have no idea who the Orthodox Christians are, many of the Protestants. 
they always have tried to classify us into some Christian category, not knowing about the original church. Many of them is imposed that the church started in the 1500s. Many of uh, Protestants, for example, they think, um, and this is a known fact, uh, if you talk with them, I'm talking about nominal, regular people, uh, they think that the church was began with Christ, with the, with the day of the Pentecost, and there was uh, those three, let's say, centuries, maybe a persecution, where the Christians were hiding and lived, serving in fear, hiding from the, uh, for the persecutors, but then the, there is a huge gap between, let's say, the third century and the 1500s, by the time of the Reformation, that none of the Protestants want to talk about it, like the church stopped to exist, to exist. So we as Orthodox, we rightfully say, pose the question, either the Protestants uh, are right, or Christ is false. Because Christ, when he organized the church, when he founded the church upon the fate of Peter, meaning the fate of, uh, uh, of the people at the time, he said, I'm going to build upon, um, in chapter, in Matthew chapter 16, he says, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church, not even the gates of hell will be able to prevail. He never said, I'm going to build 40,000 different denominations, so you can choose and pick which one you like, and you can go along with it. No, he's at one church, and when he does that, he creates a church that continues to live throughout the ages within his holy ones, within his people. And uh, for uh, an average Protestant, many of those, uh, uh, that, that part of the church history is unknown. Why? Because they have cut themselves off from the holy tradition of the church. And we'll see uh, why and how uh, that happened. So um, then also, the, they uh, only fewer knowledgeable, for example, the church in many cases, very superficially about the history of the church since Pentecost, know something about the Orthodox scriptures, but very little. Sometimes they ask the Orthodox about the Theotokos and other theological questions. We will talk about uh, these differences, why, uh, why the, the, we, uh, and what kind of answer we can give it to them. But it's almost laughable when they ask Orthodox if they are Christians or not. Um, sometimes I myself was confused by a lot of uh, Protestants that I'm a, some sort of a Jewish rabbi, and uh, because the Orthodox uh, uh, you know, associates them to that. They even ask if we have the Holy Bible, uh, even though we uh, were the ones who, uh, in a way, canonized the Bible as we know it today. So this happened uh, to many priests, not just me, that I, when we talk to each other, but uh, we'll just uh, move on with this so we can understand a little bit more and understand what are the consequences of, of this movement uh, with Luther and, and the other Protestants. Founders. So Luther persecutes, um, this is the, the uh, on, on this screenshot, I have the spreading of the Bogomils in Europe and around the world. The Bogomils are basically in the 10th and the 15th centuries. And uh, we have the Manichees from the third uh, and the 13th centuries. And of course we have the Paulicians and Cathars from the 12th and the 14th century. Um, so, because Luther um, propagates that he is the authority that we must to listen instead of the Pope, people start protesting against him. So now I have a lot of different fightings within the Protestants in the, in the 16th century. They start to reform him because they don't like what he changes, adds or subtracts and so on. You can imagine that the first 80 years by the end of the 16th century in the West were already have 260 60 different churches. It took 80 years to schismatize, to divide uh, that Protestant reformational movement into 216 different denominations that all are claiming that they are true. It didn't commune with each other because they excluded the Holy Eucharist and the unity which binds the churches together. And one of the reasons in the Orthodox Church we say the church is one holy Catholic and apostolic is because we all share the same and identical Eucharist. And it's a great tragedy in the Orthodox Church, for example, when there is a schism and let's say one diocese or one local jurisdiction says, we don't want to take Holy Communion with our brothers, let's say the Russians with the Greeks or the Greeks with the Serbians or whatever that happens, that uh, because of whatever this and this reason, it, it's called a schism in the church and it's considered to be one of the greatest tragedies because the moment we stop to commune with each other through Christ, within the body and blood of Christ, we're breaking the hiton of the church. We're basically destroying the church from within. We ourselves are becoming little antichrists who are fighting against the church. So that's why the unity of the church in the order, which is a dogmatical importance, not just a doctrinal importance, but dogmatical. It's God revealed to the church can be only one, not 
uh, many churches. So Luther, of course, sees what he has done. He can't uh, see that it's, um, he can see that it's complete chaos at the time. And since he sees that what the Protestants started to do through his perspective is a complete madness, he tries to find a way to bring things in order. He calls upon the political leaders at the time, the authorities, the princes, those who were the protectors of the Protestantism, who were also for their own political, social, and other reasons were against the Roman Catholic imposement, but goes but, uh, from, from that age, but to no avail. So uh, what does he do? He threatens with death punishment. He asks for death penalty for all who differ from his theology. We see this uh, shedding of blood between the Christians uh, in, the, in the West uh, in that time in many, many occasions. So uh, sometimes even what, the, what the, the, the Roman Catholic Church did with their inquisition, which is a horrible thing what they did, became a joke comparing those. So that's why we have, for example, and this um, uh, will come to the Kelvism. So what, what basically what Luther uh, does here, he uh, uh, when he uh, proclaims himself as the only uh, authority, he basically um, proclaims himself like a new pope. And of course, he's not saying that, uh, but anyone now who uh, is opposing the Pope, uh, and he can read the Bible on his own and can interpret the Bible with his own mind, with his own power, he becomes a little Pope. So instead of having one Pope, now we have millions of Popes who are doing the same thing. And that's why this division became more prominent. He persecutes those who reform him. We now have two main sides that will break down into many other parts. We have the Lutherans and we have the Calvinists that will come later. They later have some sort of hierarchy, for example, the Calvinists, uh, something that looks like uh, what the Roman Catholics have. They have something uh, of that, but very little. Then on the other side, we have the Anabaptists who do not have no authority uh, at all. Um, they're, uh, they elect their own clergy for among themselves and they believe what they decide to believe. And Anabaptists basically were born out of Luther as the one who thought that Luther was not reforming enough. He needs to move into more radical reforms and they break out as their own way of, of, uh, of denomination. Of course, we're gonna talk not about all those 260 that we have, but those the main ones that uh, we are familiar with them today and they're still uh, around. They have no social engagement, the Anabaptists, and they withdraw into their own ghettos, not recognizing anything or anyone else. Um, those are the so-called Christians who are not interested in theology. They burn books and go live outside of any society. They were the first communists, if you put it simply. They live in communes. Then they were not interested in uh, no Christian authority whatsoever. No apostles, no holy tradition, no Luther, no Calvin, no nothing. All that goes uh, rejected. That's the Anabaptists, uh, which is uh, one wing of the Protestantism uh, schismatics. So Calvin is interesting uh, to see how rigorous he was, for example. Um, as one of the reformists who was a Lutheran and lives in Geneva, uh, in Switzerland, and this teaching of Calvinism comes in later in Netherlands, in northern part of uh, Europe, and spreads uh, now, of course, we have in many parts of uh, the United States as well. So more or less, he, Calvin, is, Calvin believes what Luther believes, but he... Uh, is emphasizing more the predestination, since Luther was not so clear regarding this theology. While Calvin was imposing this teaching, all is predestined, man is unchangeably a sinner, and so on. The grace will make you better if you become Calvinist, you can resist. There is no free choice, for example, in this uh, uh, Calvinistic theology. He was criticized in Geneva because he had his own theocratic society that he built. Uh, theocracy is when the spiritual uh, authority executes the secular state business and affairs, which is opposite of secularized society. Today, when, when we have secular society, it means that we are opposite of a theocratic society. He practiced this uh, theocracy of his for 20 years in Geneva, where some like it, some don't. Uh, some are uh, praising it, while some are criticizing it. Uh, those who were criticizing him were called dogs, pigs, idiots, stinky bastards, and those are the names he was giving to them. These are all documents that we can find even, uh, even uh, later. So um, just to uh, explain something, for example, we have theocracy of sort uh, in, the, in the East, in the Byzantine Empire. You all know the the eagle, the two-headed eagle with one crown. Uh, but most of the time, those two-headed eagles, they always were poking each other. And usually it was the church, the one who 
uh, would suffer at the end the most, uh, which is a proof that the Orthodox Church, we in the, in the church, we know that there is no society, there is no ism of this world that can bring the kingdom of heaven on earth. And even the theocracies sometimes can be the most demonic societies because if they fall into the hands, which it usually happens to people who are authoritarian or totalitarian, they go against the church. And we see in the history of the Byzantine emperor happening most of the time, the greatest persecutors of the Christian church were the emperors or the false patriarchs who were abusing the position that they had to go against the church. So something similar now happens to Calvin. So while uh, while Martin Luther is fighting the Pope, he becomes a little Pope. And Calvin, while he's fighting the idea of Christian state, which also re is represented in the, in the face of or the icon of the Pope or the Roman Catholics, now he creates his own theocratic society. So if someone criticizes him for the twisting and perverting the Christian faith that was considered original, uh, often that person would be nailed to his feet in a wooden log then they would hang him on a Genevan public square so that everyone can see him. And the next day he will be decapitated. This was a famous Calvinistic punishment. The type of Calvinism shall come into Northern Europe as well. When he was asked, why are you so much, why are you so unmerciful? Well, he would say, if the papists can behave like that, then why not us, the magistrates of Christ, cannot do the same thing? That's Calvin. You can see that Calvinism in, so, uh, in some parts of Europe, like uh, Netherlands or Holland, one of the most dominant Protestant denominations. So now um, we, we will see how Calvinism played a significant role in the material advancement in those regions of Europe, uh, because uh, the Calvinism is uh, very, very uh, materialistic uh, from its so-called theological perspective. Uh, so before we continue, the logical question arises, um, when these Protestants uh, wanted to break free from the papal oppression, why did they just not approach the Orthodox Christians at the time? Did they not know that, we were, that there were Orthodox Christians who lived at the same time as they? The answer is yes. Uh, they had some contacts. And for example, um, we have those contacts with, uh, with certain Protestant um, reformists at the time with the ecumenical, with the Patriarch of Constantinople. Uh, so one of them was, of course, uh, the successor of Luther. His name was Philip uh, Melanchthon, who was a German Lutheran reformer, collaborator with Mar Martin Luther, the first systematic theologian of the Protestant Reformation, intellectual leader of the Lutheran Reformation, and an influential designer of educational systems. Um, he was looking for a connection with the Orthodox, and we might say that he had even some sympathy for the Orthodox faith. He was looking for some compromise and was searching for some alliance or some sort of a solution. But on one hand, he did not want to let go of the heresies that Luther preached. And on the other hand, the Orthodox could not help because the most of the important centers of the Orthodox, we're talking about Constantinople, Jerusalem, Antioch, and Alexandria, where, who are the pillars of the Orthodox Church, were occupied by the Ottomans and the Muslims at the time. So it was not easy for the Orthodox Christians at those times to communicate, they uh, were barely holding on to what they had and preserving their rights within the Ottoman Empire, who was very discriminating. And it lasted for five, six centuries um, in, in many Orthodox countries. So there was not much that he could count on, on, the, uh, on uh, the Orthodox support. Uh, so this is a very, very interesting topic. A lot of people have wrote about this, these connections, why it didn't came to be. Um, the simple, we can't give a simple answer, but uh, there was historical consequences, but it was probably God's providence in such a way to those things to happen this way, because you see, uh, I don't think that, you know, if we acquire the mentality of Martin Luther, that uh, he could have become an orthodox. As I've told you, uh, Martin Luther starts with a very, very uh, uh, Open, uh, beginners, uh, let's say, uh, uh, mistake when he uh, breaks the oath as a monk and he uh, uh, gets married and he starts to go on an opposite path of what he was uh, dedicating himself to God. So uh, what is the result of the Reformation and all that happened? It's like taking something and putting some order we can say that's a reforming, but what the Protestant did was a revolution. They broke everything into pieces and created something new. They created some sort of a new Augustinian church because Martin Luther was a 
um, Augustinian monk, that he had nothing to do with the one church which already existed for 1500 years up until that time. They wanted to reform and instead create a revolution. They rejected the clergy, the holy mysteries, all the sacraments, the monasticism, the holy Eucharist, icons, confessions, all of the holy tradition. And um, Luther, who was a monk who fell and got married, just doing that is a scary thing to do to begin with. Uh, so if we would like to summarize and simplify what they believe in is something that is called uh, sola scriptura and sola fide. Uh, if something is not the Bible, don't believe. Uh, only Bible, sola scriptura, and sola fide, only faith. The Bible became the idol for the Muslims, uh, which is the Quran. Uh, the, 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 basically, the comparison is that uh, Protestants have very rational faith, and when we compare it to Islam, you will see that they're very similar in a way. For example, the Muslims, they believe that the Quran is the holiest book that you're not even allowed to touch the Quran with a bare hands. So you have to wear like a handkerchief or something to, to, to do that. And even though the Quran was written 200 years after reposal of Muhammad, the Protestants are now creating an idol out of the Bible by Sola Scriptura, then whatever is not in the Sola Scriptura in, in the Bible, then we should not accept it as a, as a truth or as a biblical truth. Even though if Martin Luther had the arrogance to even change the Bible and uh, remove certain books uh, from the Bible at the beginning, he was trying to do uh, those uh, reforms. And he did that. Uh, that's why we had some bad translation. And every time when we, you have noticed me every time when we talk about the Bible and the interpretation of the Bible, I always pledge you to read not just the Orthodox version, but to learn the Greek and the Latin language so that we can read the Bible in original, not as some interpreters. because. Even today, if you go on the internet, when you Google certain uh, passage from, from the scripture, it will give you different translation. Old King James Bible, then new version, then uh, international version, and this version and that version. And the Bible uh, has been, in a way, deformed uh, in, in because of that in, in our language. So it's one thing when we say the language is a living matter. The English that we speak today is completely different than the one that was spoken at the time of Shakespeare. Um, and I understand it. But when it comes to the Bible, there is a reason why uh, in Greece, for example, we serve the liturgy and read the Bible in Old Greek. There is a reason why in the church, uh, the, the official language of the Serbian Orthodox Church is Serbian, but it's the official, it's Church Slavonic, not just the Serbian. Serbian is, has come later. So um, this is <clears throat> why, because we want to preserve the authenticity of the Bible as it was, and not just the Bible, but also the teaching of the fathers. So sola scriptura, which is scriptural alone, is interpreted by anyone, uh, whatever, whether, uh, whatever they like it. Everyone with his Bible in their pocket becomes a little pope, interpreter of the Bible. The sola fide is only faith, or faith alone, or you don't need anything, not even a good deed, but faith, and that's enough. It's very uh, related to Calvinistic uh, theology as well. So. Uh, when Luther wants to reform the Holy Scripture, he wanted to get it get rid of the letter of St. John, the theologian from the New Testament, and the letter of St. James, the first bishop of Jerusalem. Why those? Why specifically the letter of St. James? Because the letter is witnessing completely opposite of what Luther was trying to impose. St. James says, faith without deed is dead. And this is in James 2, 26. Which means that no matter how much faith you have, if you don't show it in practice, then your faith is dead already. Here, St. James the Apostle is in a complete opposite of what Luther was teaching. So he wanted to remove that from the Holy Scriptures, but they, the reformers, failed. And then when they uh, talk about sola fide, if you point St. James to them, they are silent. In addition, we have to take the second letter of St. Peter the Apostle, 120. Above all, quote, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. We see that there is no personal subjective interpretation of the scriptures. And Peter himself condemns the Protestant spiritual delusion. Here it is in the very Sola Scriptura. And there are many examples like this in the Bible. So the Protestants didn't even have the liturgy as well, uh, like for example, as we have. Imagine if the fathers, uh, let's say, who lived in the in the third, fourth century, fifth century, like St. Basil the Great and John Chrysostomus and so forth, would come into the Orthodox Church today, they would see 
um, that this is the same liturgy, this is my liturgy, that they would recognize the, 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 the spirituality, if you will, as it was in their time. But if they visit a, visit a Protestant temple and their services, they will not know where they are. They will not be able to recognize nothing. We, for example, know that in the Roman catacombs, which is our under the, the first Christians were also painting icons, they were painting symbols on the walls, uh, not because they were worshiping idols, which is uh, nonsense, but because the icons were very well known. St. Luke, for example, the apostle, the writer of the third gospel in the, in the Bible, was the first painter of the icons. He first painted the icon of the mother of God, uh, of the third cross. He painted some uh, St. Peter and some other uh, important uh, uh, icons that are still kept uh, in certain places in Mount Athos and, and around the Orthodox uh, world. But just the subject of iconoclasm is subject on its own, and we'll talk about this uh, uh, more when, when we have time, because it's a deep uh, uh, and important uh, subject to talk about. So when we come to the Calvinists, uh, finally, um, when Cal uh, Cal Calvinism comes into the northern part of Europe, in Netherlands, and we file its base, and it will uh, bring these five theses from 1618. So if you want to become Protestants, this is what you have to believe as Calvinists, for example. The first one is called total depravity. Man is infallible without option to change simple. So meaning that um, there is no free choice in the way. Second is unconditional election. God chooses only certain people, not all people, and he knows why, but not all people. And many times they ascribe this system like God chooses his people uh, randomly. The third one, the third principle of Calvinism is this limited atonement. Um, the death of Christ had a particular design and purpose towards the elect rather than a general design and purpose towards all people. Fourth, irresistible grace. The grace is irresistible. You can deny it. If you are chosen, that's it. You can say no to it. Let us remember the words chosen because we will see very often in, in the Calvinistic theology the word chosen. Um, the fifth one is the perseverance of the uh, perseverance of the saints. God will persevere uh, pre every believer in Christ. This is a logical conclusion to the point before it. If they are chosen, called, made alive based on God's will alone, and if Christ's death guaranteed their full salvation, then it follows that God will assure their final salvation, they will preserve uh, to the end. So they believe without choice. That's what Calvinism is. Uh, in the part of um, Europe, the Calvinists will push the Roman Catholics into the basin and, and into the catacombs uh, because they will spread so much that basically Roman Catholics will have to, will be in a way persecuted in the northern part of, uh, of Europe. They will get into their, um, uh, they will get their own freedom of religious expression in the 19th century. And um, in, uh, for example, in the Netherlands, and will start to build those gigantic churches that we know today. Uh, why they got, uh, when they got their freedom back, they wanted to manifest by showing with these big cathedrals, big uh, buildings, so that everyone can see how they have returned into the public life. And many of those beautiful buildings that we have in the west of a magnificent cathedrals are an expression of uh, coming back to the life because they suffered a lot from the uh, reformation and uh, beginning of the reformation but to understand calvinistic approach uh, calvinist the impact of a calvinistic theology of the chosen ones or the or the uh, theology without choice that uh, if god chooses you there that's it you have no way to resist that that uh, even though if you create sins, even though if you live in sin, if you are chosen, that's it. You are the chosen one. And you will see that a lot of the so-called uh, prosperity gospels that are preached here and they still exist, for example, in the United States, I have direct link from, from the Calvinistic hearers. One of them is this guy who is called Max Weber. Uh, this is the book he wrote, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. Who was studying the link between Calvinist, uh, Calvinism and the material well being of the Calvinists? Uh, and Weber's argument centered on ascetic Protestantism. He said that the Calvinist doctrine of predestination led believers to seek to demonstrate their elect status, which they did by engaging in commerce and worldly accumulation. The sign that you are chosen is manifest in your well being. What a logic. So the only way you know if you are chosen one from God or from Calvin, God has a list of chosen people, is if you are accumulating material abundance, meaning if you are 
wealthy, if you are uh, uh, acquiring more and more wealth in various ways, you will, uh, it's a sign of, of, uh, of that you are chosen by God. And as you know, not just Netherlands, but Great Britain, Germany, uh, um, later on some other countries were became one of the most important colonizers of the world and they acquired their own uh, wealth by colonizing other people and they had to create these theological structures in their mind in order to justify their actions because many times this colonizations was very unhuman or against human so we have Max Weber who said Calvinism, he's, he was a philosopher, by the way, in comparison appears to be more closely related to the hard, um, hard legalism and the active enterprise of bourgeois capitalistic entrepreneurs. Finally, he says, that's, that's Max Weber. So we go now to the 18th century. I know that uh, the way we are moving with this, uh, it's kind of fast, but that's the point. We can then slowly talk about each part of the centuries and what are the consequences of the Protestant Reformation, even though it started with a noble idea to reject the corruption of the Roman Catholic Church, it spread like a wildfire in multiple heresies later on that we are still experiencing today. So now we enter the 18th century, we have the century of the Enlightenment, the age of the French philosophy, the French Revolution, the age of important changes for the whole world in the future. So what is going on? The people from the West recognize the reforms of Christianity, and they see that this God, as it is represented by the Protestants, the Reformists, the Lutherans, the Calvinists, the Anabaptists, and so on, looks more like the devil than like God. He's capricious, angry, creates death. The devil one, uh, the devil one he chooses for eternal damnations, other for some something else, and they started seeing the Protestants uh, the Protestant God is a devil. So the French philosophers and enlighteners conclude that we don't need that kind of God. So let us create some more reforms. Why can we be without God? Let us bring the reformation till the end. Let's finalize the reformation. So you have uh, created him uh, to this point, making him to look like the devil. So now we will reform him to the point that he's no longer uh, in existence or relevant. Uh, regarding God. We can create a society where we don't need him anymore. We don't want uh, a God who has his chosen ones, who is always saying who, God, who doesn't love people. Why do we need that kind of God? And we have uh, the philosophers in the 18th century, like Voltaire, Turger, uh, are the philosophers who are working on those ideas. And of course, many other philosophers, but they all come, they spring from the, the French Revolution, which it's a subject on, a subject on its own in the era of enlightenment. And their ideas went into the public and spread all, all around the world, especially all around Europe at the time. The idea that the world uh, can be without God, it's not surprising at all in that uh, all that in that century, we have someone like Darwin, like Marx, like many other famous philosophers. Darwin is angry at God because he couldn't understand why his daughter has died so young. He, maybe he has not revealed his full loss of faith in his work or, or, or acknowledge it or confess it in there, but the bitterness was overwhelming. So now I'm going to make a theory that I will revenge you. Maybe all of this is not put like that, but it looks like it on an intuitive level. Marx, on the other hand, starts to bring the ideas of creating a society without God. The God that was offered by the Protestants reformists was not something that the Enlightenment wanted to have. So they went their own way. They were considering themselves the fulfillment of the, the, the Reformation or the eschatology of the Reformation. They're going to bring the Reformation towards the end by uh, enlightening it with, with the true knowledge. So at the end of the 18th century, the opinion was that if you are religious, that it means that you are backwards, that you are stupid, narrow-minded, and live in the past. Being religious, you are not progressive and open-minded. So people started being ashamed of their religious beliefs, to feel uncomfortable being Christians, and so on. We see that uh, the spirit of enlightenment still persisting today, That uh, especially among the so-called scientists who say that we cannot mix theology and science, even though, uh, for example, in the East, we have a completely different experience regarding this. Science was always part of the theology and theology was always part of science. It's just 
The difference is that the science uses experiments as a verification of truth, while the theology uses faith as a verification of truth. And uh, even though they uh, seem different, it's it, this spiritual schizophrenia in our mind that was imposed by, by ide ideologies for us to believe like that, to think that uh, the theology, the knowing God is something opposing to the science, and science is opposing to the belief of God because uh, it, it, it has no time to, to deal with that. Um, I've told you there is a one famous joke that said uh, that maybe when the scientists finally climb the, the, the highest hill or the highest mountain and get on the top, they will see on the top, they will see a few theologians playing cards telling them we told you so. Uh, that uh, the, meaning that even though if you have different methods, they're going for the same things. If they're seeking for the truth, the truth is Christ. There's no way that they can miss that uh, goal. So. Let me see what time is it. It's uh, it's always seven o'clock. Uh, we'll uh, we'll just uh, 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 we, we're gonna pause here because we can move this for, for next uh, Wednesday. We'll, we'll continue with the 19th century, but uh, basically the 18th century uh, did something that we call the the kidnapping of the words enlightenment and the words progressive. So we can see the kidnapping of the meaning of the word of the word enlightenment and progressive very much present even today. The progressivism of the modern and postmodern ideas is all that is against God, even if it means perverting what means normal, natural, biologically indistinguishable, obviously good or evil, twisting the perspective upside down and fighting any attempt to oppose the mindlessness of their philosophy. Relativism will play a huge role in what we call progressive as decadent and vice versa. Now, the French philosophers have something completely opposite of Kelvin. By rejecting his God, they develop the idea that man is something limitless and endless. So now we shift from God to man. Man becomes God, but uh, in a secular, in a, in a world, not in a, in a Christian uh, dimension. The man should not and can achieve uh, his full potential. He can become perfect without God. He can become Superman or Uberman. We read Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophy. He becomes the prophet of, with, of what later will become the New Age. Nietzsche himself, he speaks about the Uberman or the Superman or the uh, man who is Alterman, the above all. He talks about this idea of man becoming God in, the, in his famous uh, role of Zarathustra. Even today, he's glorified among the modern and postmodern philosophers. His ideology is suddenly embedded into our very lives. One look at the modern politician from the left and from the right and into our culture, and you can see Nietzsche all over. We're living the embodiment of the ideas of these philosophers in our everyday life. They're simply everywhere. Then we will move to the 19th century, of course, uh, and the year of Romantism uh, um, and, and so on. We'll talk, talk about the Puritans, the Quakers, and the Anabaptists who are coming to the United States. But then we can talk about, um, the, 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 you cannot say that someone does not have the truth. We all have a bit of truth regardless, the branch theory and so on. We all believe in God, so we're all equal, which is the ecumenism and the very dangerous ideas of the of the spreading of these ideas of the Enlightenment, which starts with the French Revolution, which starts with the Protestant Reformation, which starts with the, with, with uh, 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 has origins in the Roman Catholic corruption uh, of the theology and of uh, other. Uh, uh, then we'll talk about American Protestantism and how it differs or what what it changes, especially the movement of the Charismatics and the speaking in tongues. We'll talk about the new age of secularism, uh, which is uh, our, our direct product of, of all of that we're trying to touch today to talk in this hour and so. We'll talk about the Chrislam. I probably you know this picture opening in 2022. It's the world religion of Chrislam, the three temples of um, the three major religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, uh, where they try to open this new world religion, all the Abrahamic faiths to combine and unite into one another. And we will see there will be no problem to do so, especially uniting the Eastern religions like the uh, Buddhism and Hinduism, because they're very open-minded to, to the, they all already believe that we are all one. So for them, it's not a problem to unite them as much as they want to uh, create a uh, progress between uniting the Christians, uh, Judaism, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. 
and we're building the bright future of the kingdom of heaven on earth, the rise of the one world religion. Those will be the topics that we're going to, to talk, um, uh, God willing, um, just uh, God willing, uh, next time, because we don't, I think we're already uh, about, uh, let me see a little bit here. I'm just going to stop sharing. Um, we'll, we'll continue to, to, to talk about this, of course, to go deeper into the, the meaning of, of the of what happened with the, with in, the, in the beginning of the 16th century with Martin Luther, with Calvin, with all the, all the other Protestant um, uh, leaders and how they impacted of bringing down what we now have the secularization of, of the faith. By secularization, I need to explain, we think of bringing the world into the church or, or nivelating, elevating the world and the, the theology into one basket, into one uh, one uh, mindset so that uh, there should be no differences. It's an attempt of creating a one religion uh, where all the differences will put aside, all the things that connect us will just be uh, emphasized and will we'll come back forward. We are already seeing the, the, this in various ways, but we will, God willing, once when we finish with this next Wednesday, we'll have time to talk about modernism, postmodernism. The implications of the teachings like Friedrich Nietzsche and other philosophers who are basically the prophets uh, or the founders of the ways of thinking of the modern postmodernism uh, thought, modernistic thought, thought of, of today. Um, all of the subjects that we, 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 we for example, uh, the challenges of so-called progressivism uh, that we're uh, finding today, like um, changing your gender or uh, being binary, non-binary, three binary, whatever you want to call it, that all has roots into the relativism uh, that now we don't need God, now let us create a religion of humanity without God and basically creating uh, a kingdom of heaven on earth, so we don't have to look for the kingdom of heaven. And uh, if we remind ourselves what the apostles have taught us and what Christ himself is talking is about the kingdom of heaven. The very first sermon that St. John the Baptist is uh, proclaiming and Christ is uh, also saying is, repent for the kingdom of heaven is in it. Everything is happening because of the kingdom of heaven, not uh, not because of uh, creating some happiness into this world. On the other hand, we are not dualists like the Manichees, thinking that the world is evil, but rather the, the world is fallen because of our perversion of the of evil that God gave us. And uh, for that reason, this is not a simple subject, but we, we sometimes we have to use simple uh, terms or simple um, uh, ways to explain this uh, to in order to go deeper into more interesting more important uh, topics for this. So that will be all that I would like to um, share with you for now. We will continue with the 19th century uh, and what happened in the 19th century, of course, the 20th century, and what, what's happening today uh, in the, in, on, on our next Bible studies. And maybe then we can talk a little bit more about some other uh, uh, things that uh, we can also uh, explore. Okay, guys, uh, do you have any questions? So far. Yeah, I do, Father. A uh, quick question. This idea of Chrislam and ecumenism and these efforts to create one world religion, it's absolutely insane what they're trying to do. And I can't imagine how they can even agree upon anything given the giving the differences in, in their space. I mean. It, it, it's it's absolutely insane. I mean, yeah. this is the first time I ever heard of this thing called Chrislam, and I just looked at it online, no. and it's in the United Arab Emirates in Dubai, and they've got these buildings. And there's there's a picture of Pope Francis. Um, yeah. The tragic thing is that you know um, we the reason why we're having this is for us to understand the roots of how we are getting to a point to justify. Uh, heresy, to justify stupidity, to justify blindness, and to justify atheism. So uh, I all to recommend to all of you, if you have time, whenever you have time, to read the books of Friedrich Nietzsche, especially, I don't know what is the English title, 
that's how Zarathustra spoke. I think, I think that's the working title that I comes to my hand that I'm translating in my mind, but that's one of the most famous works that Nietzsche did, in which Zarathustra says, God is dead. Hmm. Now I am alive. So we don't need more God because the humankind or the human being can become God without God. So it's basically resurrecting the idea of Lucifer or the serpent head for Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden when he proposed to them, don't you know, he says, that you can become God even if you eat from this fruit because you will know uh, how to differentiate or discern between good and evil. And now the same lie is being repeated just now on a more grandiose level because with the internet, with the mass media, we're all interconnected. And we can all share ideas and philosophies like that. It's a very powerful tool. Let's just for an example, uh, many of us will disagree, for example, to have uh, what we read in the, the Apocalypse, uh, the, the book of Revelation, the, the so-called the seal of Antichrist. But let me ask you this, James. Now, in order to store all of your information, uh, let's say you have a driving license, you have insurance card, you have uh, medical history, you have bank account, you have, I don't know, maybe a brokerage account, you have this, you have that, you have uh, medical records of your vaccines or not vaccines or pills you're taking or not taking. Uh, genetics, history, and whatnot, why would you keep all this data into some sort of a cloud or some sort of a uh, hardware or a, a piece of paper or whatnot, when you can just store it in one simple chip that we can put it on your forehead, on your hand, and you will carry it everywhere. You don't have to. You will be happy. You will, you will, it will make your life much, much easier. And, you know, we will, you will be surprised, we all get, will get surprised how much we're willing to sacrifice in order to, um, to please uh, the, the crowds, to please the, 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 the social uh, status or the, the peer pressure. I only, uh, to recommend to all of you, there is a beautiful 20 minutes uh, uh, YouTube video by Jonathan Peugeot, I think the latest one that he published. Yeah, yeah. He talks about, uh, I think it was called, um, he talks basically about uh, the same thing that we're experiencing now. He says um, that many times the, we fall into this temptation, which is very hard temptation for all of us, to justify uh, the actions of our compassions. So, for example, you all remember uh, the, the part of the gospel when uh, Mary Magdalene, she pours out this precious myrrh upon Christ that Judah says, why did she did, did do this when we could have sold that and with those 300 denarius that we're going to get from, from, that, uh, from that sale, we could have given to the poor. And Christ says to him, enough, he says, you have the poor always with you. You don't have me always with you. And he basically, uh, the, the apostle writes, Judas did not this, did this because he truly was concerned about uh, the poor but because he was a thief, and he wanted to make a profit. So, but Judah, Judah uses, this perfect, uh, uses this perfect argument to uh, play on Christ's compassion, who was always speaking about helping the poor, clothing the naked, visiting the sick and the, those in prison, to use this as an argument to, uh, to satisfy his own greed. On the other hand, we have... Uh, Jonathan Bejo, he mentions this movie, it's called, I think, Missionaries or Mission, which is our two Roman Catholic, another Roman Catholic missionaries in the 15th and the 16th century. They traveled to Japan, or maybe later, but doesn't, it's a movie made by Martin Scorsese. It's a brilliant movie, where they found the first uh, Christian communities on the, on the banks of Japan, but the J Japanese society is brutal towards them. And instead of persecuting the missionaries, they persecuted the newly created Christians by these missionaries, by killing their families, killing them, torturing them. So now it became a moral dilemma for the missionaries. What are they going to do uh, with all of this happening in front of their eyes? Are they willing to continue to preach Christ and see how their flock is being scattered and, and uh, slaughtered in front of their eyes, or in order to save their parishioners or their members of their flock, they themselves will convert and stop preaching Christ, maybe convert to Buddhism or uh, emerge, or emerge themselves with the Japanese culture. So because of the, the idol of compassion, many of us will say, we, well, we can do this. We will rather become uh, Buddhists or we'll denounce Christ 
and we will become uh, we will align a system to save 1,000 lives, for example. There's a beautiful scene in that movie where uh, the main character who uh, was finally being caught by the Japanese and they put an icon of Christ down on, on the ground and they're asking him to step on the icon with his feet in order to denounce Christ and to spit on it. And there is an inner conversation between the character and Christ who is in the icon. He speaks to him. He says, don't worry, spit on me. Uh, step on me i'm not going to judge you because of that what you are doing you're saving the lives of other thousands so the moral dilemma that the director of the movie mm. is, course, is, is putting is that what should we do are we going to denounce christ in order to save let's say 1000 people or we're willing to stay with christ but in front of our eyes see the death of 1000 people and this is the very powerful temptation that uh, we're seeing into this nietzsche is the one who is posting this many, many centuries before, many centuries, a couple of centuries before that. Uh, to, what, what do we do? So this is the birth of humanism. We'll talk about this next Wednesday and all the implications of the humanism, which is has nothing to do with Christianity. Because Christ gives us the answer. He says, um, he says, let you let the poor alone. You will always have the poor with you. But I am not going to be with you all the time like I am now here. So let her, don't you know that she's preparing me for her burial? And that's how we uh, enter into the narrative of uh, the story of, 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 of what Christ is uh, explaining to her. While Judah had completely different interests uh, into that, not because he was caring about the poor, but because he was caring about it. He was the one who was for three and a half years. Uh, he's uh, with Christ seeing all the miracles, but at the same time, he continues with his betrayal and completely missing out on Christ. Yeah, Isaiah, go ahead. All right. Uh, so let me lower this real quick. There we go. So I heard, I was listening to uh, two different conversations that um, uh, I like following. So I was listening to... Uh, um, a brief interview on another channel uh, called Warrior Poet Society. They were interviewing a Protestant uh, theologian named Dr. William Lane Craig, who's very famous for being a positivist of uh, sort of defending mere Christianity through things that can be provable, uh, battling new atheists and stuff like that. And so he's very much in the uh, in the headspace in the world of of sort of the Victorian era classic Christian apologist kind of thing um and he had made the point that uh experientially uh while uh, essentially he made the point and uh i i don't know enough whether to confirm or deny his conclusion but he said that the world is by and large not postmodern that the west is still very modernist and still thinks in modernist terms it's just that they uh they've adopted relativism which is not quite the same as postmodernism, um, and that there that 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 very few people are actually willing to make that jump. Yeah, well, uh, is that's the one thing. But then the other thing was that um, you know we've heard a lot. I mean, I've heard it for a long time about the whole notion of one world religion, uh, and sort of and you know the 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 technocratic state and all that kind of stuff. So there is that, and and as and at least the technology side of it, that's not going to go away anytime soon. But I mean, I think there's, but there's another side of it too. It's not just, it's not just ecumenism. I think. So I mean, ecumenism is very much a, a big thing, a big problem. But on the other hand, too, there's a whole other side of the spiritual thing that's going on that people are not paying enough attention to, and that's. That's uh, that's that's the rise of interest in mystical traditions that are not Christian, yes. and the use of drugs and psilocybin and stuff yes. and New Age, and these people and not only but most importantly, mm -hmm. people's big uptake of interest in neo paganism. Yes, yes. I, I mean, I fully I'm, agree with you. I fully agree, and I'll I'll, I'll give yeah. Go ahead, finish. I thought, yeah. I mean the whole intellectual side of things, the whole, our rationalism, the modern age is falling apart. It's breaking. It's breaking. 
postmodernism is not going to be the new enemy. The new enemies, we're going to be launched back into the second century. Yes. Experientially. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be old school pagans again. Oh, yes. Like the, the state, I mean, there may, maybe there's a transition period where it's all about humanism and state power, but that's going to fall apart because people are tired of logical systems because the West has beaten that horse to death to death people want real spiritual experience and it's not about this and it's not just about making a better utopia society people don't want utopia we already have it i have everything i've ever wanted at the tip of my fingers and i'm not happy right i have all the material wealth i could ever ask for all i have to do is get off my ass yes that's right but people are not happy with that and people keep saying oh the reason we're not happy is because we don't have enough stuff. No one believes that. Yeah. The communists are stupid. They're not going to last. Yeah. Uh, Isaiah, I fully agree with you the, with the fact that you know um, uh, we're we're regressing towards the second century from from a spiritual perspective because you know uh, when when we were stripped uh, from from um, spiritual experience, when we even secularize our fate, when we basically rationalized to our fate basically of uh sometimes the pastors the christian leaders in order to speak eloquently in front of their flock they have to use scientific uh, proof in order to uh, um, be make themselves relatable to their uh to their flock in order for them to understand and what a shame is this because the faith has so much abandoned uh, uh us that now you know, we, we basically, the young people who are coming, uh, they have on the tip of their fingers the whole world, just in their pocket. We all have these devices we call phones and, and, and uh, powerful so much, many, many, many times more powerful than the, the machine and the rockets we use to send men on the moon. But the thing is that, on the other hand, the, 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 the basis, the root of for example, all of the discussion that we have, it's something that you wanted to mention, but I, maybe I can put in one, it's called the Luciferianism. Is putting uh, up front the new religion in which says basically the following, this is the new theology, the new spirituality. God is a tyrant and uh, Lucifer liberated Adam and Eve into the yeah. to paradise and gave them the promise uh, that that they will break free from the tyranny of God, and God punishes them, but they by, for them being here. And now, basically, we need to come back to our roots to uh, again, once again, try to build a Babylon tower based on the guidelines of the uh, Luciferian proposal. And all of these things that we're talking about, things that are happening in the 18th century, starting from the 16th century, but 18th century, 19th century, the modernism, the enlightenment before that, and the romantism and, uh, and, and, and uh, postmodernism that will come and so forth. All of those things are leading to this new spirituality because, uh, you know, if we have one universal health system, for example, the logical consequences will be have one monetary system. We have the Bitcoin, Ethereum, we have other cryptocurrencies that can do that. We, we can have one military system in order to defend ourselves from the UFOs and from whatever the, the, the external enemies. We can have one eternal worldly police and why not one worldly religion? The problem is that no world religion cannot be nothing more but uh, neo, uh, uh, neo-paganism. And the neo-paganism, let me just make myself clear just to uh, explain once again the, the dilemma that in the movie of Scorsese we have when this monk uh, had to choose either to spit on the icon of Christ and convert and save 1,000 people or embrace the icon of Christ and see how uh, his friends and brothers and sisters in Christ were being slaughtered in front of his name. Here's the dilemma that we, in this environment of, of, uh, uh, we're finding ourselves, we need to make choices to understand which are those that can bring us closer to Christ or far off from Christ. And, when we put in front of ourselves uh, the, the humanism as an idol that we need all to bow down to and, and follow, and that includes compassion, sentimentalism, and all of that it follows from, from, the, from the basic human um, ethos or, or, or nature, then we bow down and, and subdue 
everything that is spiritual to us. And it's so easy to do because in the perverted image of, in which we live now, we're basically falling down and we're um, embracing the second idea. In the, in the movie, it ends like this. The guy spits on Christ. He stamps upon the icon of Christ. And he, uh, later on, at the end of the movie, is shown how he's, he lives in the, with his family. He dies, already being married, having children. And he's being cremated. But while someone breaks the urine to see the ashes of his uh, you know, burned body, cremated body, there is a little cross that he hid the whole time under his clothing to preserve the fate in Christ. So basically, uh, the, the message of the movie, it's, as far as I understood it, is that you can still be a Christian, but you can also be a pagan. And here is the dilemma. In the time of Julian the Apostate and other persecutors of the Christians in the first three centuries, many of the persecutors of the Christians, the emperors or the governors, they were not saying to the Christians, you are not allowed to believe in Christ. They said, you can believe in Christ as much as you like. We don't mind that. We can actually, as a matter of fact, there are many emperors in Rome who wanted to make a statue in the pantheon of gods in Rome, of Christ. But they would say, while you believe in Christ, you also put some incense of a little bit into the uh, idols that we believe in, into the gods that we trust. And then with, no one's going to touch you. You're going to have all the dignities and all the rights as a true citizen of the Roman Empire. Many of the Christians thought that doing that kind of compromise is worth dying for. And they refused to do that, and they were killed. Many Christians fail into the temptation. They said, well, it's not a problem. I can... You know, in my heart, I will still be a Christian. No one can take away Christ from my heart, but I can put some, um, you know, incense into the pagan gods. And then he goes uh, and, and, and they, they do that and they fall away from it. There was actually a dispute in which uh, there was even one uh, group of Christians who were condemned as heretics or they were excommunicated from the church because they didn't want to accept those Christians who denied Christ in the time of the persecution of three years that it lasted us under lasted under Julian the Apostate, who was persecuting the country, wanted to bring the, back the, the fate of our fathers, which is the pagan gods in Rome. And they were all um, abandoned. And then the church excommunicates these Christians because they say church, the church above all is a mother. And if they show true repentance, which many of them they show, under penance, they can be still accepted into the church. And there were canons in which they were under spiritual penance, under which conditions they can come back into the church and become full members of the church, which means they were not allowed to take Holy Communion for a certain period of time, and they had to do other types of spiritual penance. So the question is very, this is probably one of the most important questions uh, of temptations that we have today. Are we willing to serve the God of compassion, or are we are willing to serve the true God, uh, uh, the, the Holy of Holies, the one who the one who is we call our creator, the one who is Jesus Christ, the one we call the Holy Spirit and God the Father. So the basic question is within this. Many of the, the Christians, they would go, I would rather die and sacrifice myself. Those Christians could have been easily being accused as murderers. You allowed 1,000 uh, parishioners to be killed because you wanted to serve your God. And that's the problem. So that's the dilemma that, that we even read in the gospel about Mary, uh, Judas, and Christ when they uh, have that encounter. So uh, when we read the language of the fathers, we understand that there is no end when we die. Our life just begins. And if we believe in that, there is no reason for us to, to fear death. As one saint says, what is death? Two seconds. And then true life begins. So everything that we do now is, is, is a preparation for that moment. For, for our Pascha, for our Passover from this life to eternal life. It's very important how we move from this life into eternal life. But the delusions of the world we live in, these this upside down pictures, the icon of, of, the, of the Lucifer as a true God and God as a tyrant is the one that is being propagated uh, in, into these uh, ideologies. That, but behind all of these reformations, behind all of these enlightenments, behind all of this modernistic and postmodernistic ideas, the, the Nietzsche's of the world and whatnot, is Lucifer, is this idea, is this that the same, same ideology of, of the question in the paradise, 
by Adam and Eve. Don't you know that you can become God without God? Why would we need a kingdom of heaven when we can make one on earth? Which, for example, is the, the, the idea of communism wants to achieve or socialism to create in a kingdom of heaven, a utopistic society that is on earth to make life better on earth. And everything that we do, uh, all the politics, all the culture, the art does in, 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 in an effort to achieve this. We know as Christians that this is a false narrative, this, this will end. But it's very important to, under, to emphasize because we're talking about Protestantism today, there were a lot of Protestants who were basically poisoned by these ideas. And they were, many of them are Heliasts. They don't even know that, that the Heliasm, believing that Christ will dwell for 1000 years here was a heresy condemned by the fathers, not by the fathers, by the, the apostles themselves at the very beginning. Many of the ideas of manyism or the dualism were the condemned by the apostles because they existed within the different Gnostic uh, teachings and, and, and religions at the time. And, and uh, the problem is that uh, that's why we need to clarify first when we say, well, we're all Christians, yes, but Christ in the Orthodox Church is not the same Christ like in, let's say, in the Pentecostal Church or, or a Calvinistic Church or some Anabaptist Church. So that's why we need to understand why, because starting with the Reformation, the Reformation never ends. It just goes on and on and on and on, and will move on into the, uh, the Chrislam, or the, the, the idea of uh, we need to belong in one. The most famous idea is the, and I don't want to keep you too long for this, is the so-called the branch theory, which says all of the Christian denominations, or all of the religions of the world, there are more than 15,000 different religions in the world, including the different Christian denominations, are all having parts of the truth. But no one has uh, 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 independent full knowledge of the church. When they're all together combined and united under one uh, religion, uh, then they can have claim that they can have the whole knowledge and truth of God. This is the, the mother of all heresies. St. Justin Popovich calls uh, the heresies of the pan heresies, the heresies of all heresies, because you're combining all the heresies that existed or existing where we would exist into one uh, theological system. And that's why it's so dangerous. And the problem is that when James was talking about this, how can this be James? Go back 20 years or 25 years from now, uh, try to uh, imagine yourself how we thought about society in the world then, and what has happened today, and how many crazy things and ideas were never th thought of that possible 25 years or 50 years ago. Now, not just that they're possible, but we're living through them. Um, I, I cannot express to you how many times we, we read on the, on the news or, or on the internet all these crazy ideas about this and that, and um, it, it will just, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're coming to a point that nothing surprises us anymore. Nothing surprises. And that's why I agree with Isaiah when he says that we are regressing to the second century. Yes, the church will come back into the catacombs. That's for sure. If, because we cannot at the same time sit in two chairs. We cannot serve God, say that we serve God, and at the same time sit on the chair and serve Lucifer. Uh, we, can, we have to choose one master. We we'll either choose the kingdom of heaven or we choose the kingdom of the world. The, the last temptation that Christ said had in the desert, because today uh, we celebrate Theophany, right after his baptism, he went into the desert, was when Lucifer came to him, when Satan came to him, and he tempted him, listen, look at all these kingdoms of the world. I govern all of them. If you bow down to me, I will give them all to you. And Christ says, no, get away from me, Satan. Meaning that that's the moment when we know that Christ uh, is very determined and reveals himself as a Messiah, that he's coming here to deliver us from this tyrant who is ruling everything. But the tyrant, the prince of this world, he continues to rule until the final judgment. So uh, we just need to be patient and you know, wait for the Lord to come. That's, that's you know, how he, the Bible ends. You know, uh, come, O Lord, come soon. Those are the words of St. John the Theologian. Yeah, go ahead, Zayo. Just unmute yourself. You can hear. Sorry, I don't want to take up uh, too much of other people's time because if they want to say things, uh, I hope they can. But uh, so interrupt me if you want to. <laughs> but uh, 
in in kind of uh, in talking about uh, ecumenism and its problems and stuff, and in uh, sort of trying to articulate the beauty of the Orthodox Church to uh, to my friends, um, there is for all of uh, American Protestants' problems, the one thing that is certain is that they love Jesus. And as such, I, I always find like the best way to describe the church is to start with Christology of who is Christ. And what does it mean that Christ's bones were not broken, that only his side was pierced and that his body remained whole? And what does it mean that we are the body of Christ and that Christ's body was never rent in two. It was never cut into pieces. It was never sawed up. It was, it was, it was perfectly whole. Or like the notion of everything being Christocentric. Because that's that's the thing I I I I'm trying to I'm trying to learn Christology because it's because it's such a it's the most direct thing up front, up forward. And from which all the other church teachings of the church stem yeah. um, are trying to do Christology. Isaiah, let me clarify something that I think is very important that I, I, I forgot to mention since the very beginning of uh, this, but uh, thank you for because just uh, you just reminded me of this. When we talk about the differences between Protestantism and, and let's say, Orthodox theology, and why we, we, uh, we let's say, sometimes when we use the word like they're heretics and this and this and that they have inherited a lot of heresies, what this is has nothing to do with the, on a, what, what happens on the personal level. Meaning, I can tell you that uh, it's uh, Protestantism and Protestants are different, two different things. We make a clear distinction or discernment between uh, a heresy and a human being, a yep. heresy and a heretic. A heretic is the one who, if he repents, if he comes back to his senses, if he exclaims the words of the prodigal son who says he came to himself, aha, uh -huh, there is food, there is water, there is roof over my head in my father's home. Why don't I go there while I'm, and stuck, while I'm stuck here with the pigs and eating with them? Then it's okay. But the heresy itself needs to be uh, addressed and it needs to be put on a, on a, on a state and, and uh, explain so that it won't exist and gives uh, a reason to, to more people to get infected by. It. So let me be very clear. I have found many, many, many Protestants, brothers and sisters, uh, to my great surprise, uh, but positive surprise, especially when I came to the United States, that they're more Christian in their heart, more honest in their faith than a lot of Orthodox that I've met. So uh, who will be the judge? Not me, not you, but Christ himself. That's why in the Orthodox Church we teach, do not judge anyone but thyself. We judge only ourselves. Who's going to be saved or not going to be saved? That's not up to me and you to decide. We have the mysteries, we have the church, we'll go here and we'll, we'll start. But it is God the one who will judge. But when it comes to defining a heresy and crystallizing the, the Christology, you will see that all of the heresies, most of the heresies, like 90% of the heresies throughout the history of the church were Christological. As Christ himself, don't, the, the, the apostles said, don't you know that he is the stumbling block upon many will fall, upon which many will fall. He is. Christ is the, the foundation stone upon everything is built, being built. And uh, those heresies are very serious because if we don't address them, they will continue to, to, to dwell amongst us and will produce consequences that we're seeing and experiencing living through them now. You know, uh, the reason why, why, why it's a very important, why, why I started with saying about Martin Luther, the greatest, mis the, the moment I lost interest in Martin Luther, that he's a serious person, is when he defiled the oath that he himself gave to God to be a monk. He could have done these reforms within monastic life. St. Maximus, the confessor, he was, persecuted his whole life by the church, by the canonical uh, patriarch and a canonical emperor of the East. And he died in, in an exile. St. John Chrysostomus, he was persecuted by the so-called Orthodox you know, brothers and sisters. And he died in exile. 
but he never abandoned his monastic oath. Well, what did Martin Luther do? He followed his bodily passions. He even consumed the marriage with a nun who also broke her soul before they got married. And then he starts attacking the church, which is rightfully so. I know his ideas, but his way of doing things is completely perverted. While in the Orthodox Church, we give examples of people who are fighting the corrupted authority of, of certain church leaders or, or heretics and so on, but they were not doing so by abandoning their basic uh, identity, monastic identity, for example. St. John Chrysostom was never uh, chose in exile to get remarried and change his lifestyle because he saw that it, this doesn't work with the emperor now anymore. So let, let's, I'm going to give up. I'm going to change this and I'm going to start my own you know, ways of religion. I'm going to call Chrysostomus religion or St. Maximus the Confessor. No, he died by the very end in what he gave because the reason why they became what they became was because of God, because of Christ. They, they gave an oath. So those are the inputs. The reason I'm emphasizing this is because Sometimes we can observe a, a, a certain, let's say, movement like Protestantism without knowing the people behind it and what was their life, what was the content of their character, not the, the color of the skin or the, the, the language that they spoke or the, whatever the, 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 the style that they had or the time when they lived, but what was the content of the character. So, I, I, of course, I'm speaking now as this is my personal opinion, I'm not imposing on any of you, but the reason why we have this discussion, which now has taken too long, we're going to uh, uh, finish it now, is because we want to clarify this things and develop a discussion, uh, have a uh, Q&A about this. We'll, God, will, God will, will continue about the 19th century, the 20th century, and what's happening with the, the modern uh, ideas about creating a one world religion. And we'll understand how it's all connected with not just Protestantism, but also with with the split of the church in 1054 and many things that are happening because this idea is not from yesterday it's rooted in many many uh, it's long long time ago starts i think uh, as i've said before with the idea in, in the paradise of becoming gods without god and and that's why we, we're going to talk about it but guys I, I can see already we're almost two hours into it uh, i just wanted to know that uh, we'll say the prayer and just stay for one minute and we'll uh, just uh, i'm gonna uh, finish the recording now. We'll say the prayer, and then I uh, just wanted to give you some directions about our new Patreon page that we have. Uh, if you like, you can join, where most of the content will be published from now on over there because it's going to be easier for us to uh, uh, to do that. So let's say the prayer, and uh, we'll finish for tonight. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, both now and into the ages of ages. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come. The will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, both now and now to the ages of ages. Amen. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, through the prayers of our holy fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and save us. Amen.